Question, have you ever wondered what Trafalgar Law's face would look like if he ate sour plums? Don't lie to me, I know you have. And so here it is. And well, you're welcome. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we have some absurd new information regarding the series to go through, straight from the mouth hole of Echiro Oda himself, courtesy of a new SBS segment. Much of which contains revelations regarding Kaido, Doflamingo, and even the eternally fabled Gear Fifth, as well as much, much more. But first up, if you're not aware of what an SBS segment is, then don't worry, that's why I'm here. I keep up with these things so that you don't have to. You're a busy person after all. But the reason why I do this is because quite often these teeny pockets of information will reveal some pretty world-changing stuff. It's very similar to subscribing to the Grand Line Review, actually. The act in and of itself seems minor and perhaps even frivolous. However, it will result in consistent injections of One Piece culture being uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. So just as I refuse to ignore the SBS, you should refuse to ignore the, uh, the S, the S standing for subscribe, I suppose. And please do say hi in the comments below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet. Welcome. We're going to begin today with something that almost jolted me out of my seat when reading this. So which is that Oda has very, very casually revealed the name of Kaido's mythical devil fruit, and it is called the Uo no Mi mythical type model Seryu. And in English, this would be the fish fish fruit, which in case you're unaware, refers to the myth of a koi fishy swimming up a waterfall, after which point it was rewarded for its efforts and transformed into a magnificent dragon. In addition to this, the Library of Ohara, who is responsible for translating all of this, by the way, link to him in the description below. But he posits that the fish name may be used because one of the Japanese words for dragon being Ryu is already in use for some of the ancient Zoan dinosaur fruits. But in regards to the name Seryu, this is a direct reference to one of the four mythical beasts said to guard Japan, the other three being Genbu, Suzaku, and Byako, which are a tortoise, phoenix, and a tiger, respectively. So very interestingly, the existence of a Seryu-specific fruit may imply the existence of the other three mythical beasts also out there in some kind of delicious fruit form. Although I suppose Marco does already kind of fit that whole phoenix bill, even if he isn't attributed to Suzaku, but eh, it's fascinating to think about. However, what really, truly blows me away are the circumstances under which we learned this information. So for some context, an SBS segment is basically where fans ask Oda questions and his answers are printed in the manga volumes. However, in this case, the question wasn't something obvious like, uh, what is the name of Kaido's devil fruit, hmm? The question was actually, if Zoro, Nami, Usopp, Sanji, and Frankie were to become ability users, what fruit do you think they would have eaten? And from that, the answer for Zoro was Kaido's devil fruit, the Uo Unami Modo Seryu, with the caveat that Oda would rather have one of Zoro's swords eat the fruit, kind of like Spandam's Blade Funk Freed, I suppose. But it's just so wild that something this grand would be buried away in the back of a manga volume like this, instead of being revealed in, I don't know, the actual series, maybe. In case you're interested though, and I know you are, when it comes to Nami, she would have the Gora Gora no Mi, NL's Devil Fruit, which is perfect, terrifying, and I would love to see it. Meanwhile, Usopp would eat the Pocket Pocket no Mi, being the Pocket Pocket Fruit, which I believe belongs to Blamenko. And I believe this is also the first time that this fruit has been officially named. And very simply, it allows him to create pocket dimensions, this is pretty much anywhere on his body, like a pocket to store things, which I really like actually. Very, very cool power. When it comes to Sanji, according to this, he would eat Senor Pink's devil fruit, the Sui Sui no Mi, or the Swim Swim fruit, which Sanji, I think we know, would not go for given the choice because we do know that he is very invested in the invisibility powers of the Suke Suke no Mi. But at the same time, these are the fruits that Oda would like to see the Straw Hats consume, the sort of thing that he says, oh, that would be cool, not the ones that these characters would necessarily want themselves. And for Frankie, Oda would like to see him with Baby Five's power was the Buki Buki no Mi, which would be pretty damn awesome, effectively just spawning infinite cyborg weapons. And he'd probably use it a lot better than Baby Five does as well due to his advanced weaponry knowledge. Moving on to another question now, we have a fan named Hata who asks, Oda-sensei, hello. According to my grandma, Yamato's birthday is on November 3rd. Is that so? To which Oda responds with, well then, I guess it's November 3rd. Very much showing the bizarre power that fans can have in these SBS segments. In fact, fans are sometimes responsible for inventing entire canon characters, with two very famous cases being Chaton and Momo Usagi, both vice admirals of the Marines, and both were actually invented in a fan question, which I find quite cool. But next up, we have an inquiry about Kid and Killer. I'm really, really curious to see how Kid and Killer's first love, Shiruton Doroyanaika, looks like. I wonder what kind of face does she have? I bet she's a real cutie. Which, <laughs> to understand this, you kind of need to delve back into a prior SBS, where it is revealed that as children, both Kid and Killer had a crush on the same girl, Shiruton, who one day spilt curry udon noodles on herself, after which Kid and Killer made fun of her, which prompted Shiruton to beat them both up. And to this day, both Kid and Killer hate curry udon noodles due to that traumatizing experience. However, the big question here is what does Shiraton look like? Well, behold, 
the glory of Shiraton, assumedly after just having spilt the noodles on herself. And she embodies this very stelly like aesthetic. But now for a very potentially important question, if Luffy's Gear 4 is a thing, then will Gear 5 be a thing too? A fan named Sosekun basically asking that thing that the online One Piece fan base has been discussing ever since Gear 4 was first introduced. And very notably, this question was sent with uh, well, terrible handwriting, very terrible handwriting. And apparently it looked something like this. Despite that, this is actually a very important and relevant question. So how does Oda respond to this inquiry? Very well, seeing the passion in your handwriting, I feel obligated to include this question as I received it. Will five be a thing? Right now, the enemy we have to defeat is the man said to essentially be the world's strongest. Because of that, the world is in the age of transitioning from 4G to 5G. G means gear, right? And a lot of this can be taken as a pretty stupid joke. Oda basically referring to the real world transition to 5G, the uh, fifth generation of mobile phone networks, not a reference I ever expected to see in One Piece ever, but here we are. However, I think that people might be sleeping on this response though, as funny and as clearly a joke as it is. I don't see it as such an outrageous takeaway to think that Oda is hinting at or maybe even blatantly dropping the idea of Gear 5th in the near future. I mean, bigger things have certainly been revealed in SBS segments before, but to be fair, it is incredibly difficult to gauge the tone of someone through writing alone, and not only that, through translated writing. So it could 100% be a joke, or it could be some Gear 5th hype, or hey, it could also be both. But moving on, we have another kind of mind-blowing revelation about what could have been with one Don Quixote do Flamingo, which comes to us in the form of question. All of the beast pirates are named after card games, right? Answer, yep, indeed. The three all-stars are pretty obvious, but all of the flying six, the numbers and the headliners, only excluding Drake, Apu and Hawkins, are all named after card games, as well as the King, Queen, Jack, and one's 10 cards. If I were to list them all, I'd be filling this entire page. I hadn't even heard about some of these. I imagine there were many types of games out there, but there really are many ways to play with just playing cards alone. By the way, in Dress Rosa, Dolphamingo being called Joker is a remnant of an initial idea where Dolphamingo was going to fight as a powerful companion of Kaido in the Wano country. He's quite the tricky opponent, so I'm glad we got rid of him at Dress Rosa. And there you have it. Imagine that the OG plan for Dolphamingo was to be fighting right here and now alongside Kaido on Wano, which does make the Joker name fit quite nicely, considering he was going to be a much closer associate of the Beast Pirates. And I guess I don't know exactly how old that plan was or when Oda decided to veer away from it, but it's pretty epic to think about. Also a little bit despairful because on top of two emperors and the entirety of the Beast Pirates, to think that the allied forces would also need to deal with Doflamingo uh, sounds like a pretty hopeless situation. It does also make me wonder though, like if Oda stuck to his original plan, does that mean that we never would have had the Dress Rosa arc at all? Or would it still have happened, but with a different main antagonist? Because it put in a lot of work building features like the Straw Hat Grand Fleet and such. So who could have replaced Doflamingo as the main antagonist of Dress Rosa? I'm kind of at a bit of a loss to be honest with you, but if you have any ideas, then yeah, please do throw them in and dem comments. All right, next up, I'll put in a bit of a spoiler warning. I don't I don't think it's anything major to be honest with you, but it does concern some of early Act 3 Wano material. So skip to this time if you don't want to know anything at all. But for now, our next question is going to be, Adachi, I have a question. In chapter 962, Daimyo and Vassals, a young Izo can be seen wielding a katana while Kiku wields a gun, but it's currently the complete opposite. Is there any reasoning behind this? Which is something that I honestly didn't notice. A very cool, weird detail there, but let's see how Oda responds to this. The gun Kiku was holding was just her brother gun, nothing more to it. I'm surprised you spotted that in such a small panel. The two of them had a debauched father and were forced by depraved adults to entertain them ever since they were small. But even if they were poor, they were very close to each other. One of the tricks they used to entertain was sharpshooting, which Izo had 10 out of 10 flawless precision in. However, he was never very confident with the sword. As time went by and he ended up on Whitebeard's ship when he was showing off his shooting, Flower Blades Vista told him, you should use that specialty of yours to protect others. What good is a samurai obsessively sticking to a sword if he cannot protect protects their lord with it. Samurai is a way of life after all, so Izo abandoned the sword and picked up the gun. Which really is quite a lovely story, especially because I think Izo is still quite underexplored compared to all of the other vassals. So I really enjoyed learning about his decision to become a gun wielder, having grown up on the land of Samurai, especially since that prompt came from Vista specifically, who himself is obviously a swordsman. Very fun request now. Please draw the perv co- mm -hmm. I mean, Sanji at ages 40 and 60 in the future, please. I'm counting on you. So this is 
something that Oda has done very consistently for the past few volumes with other Straw Hats as well as with Ace, but we have time skipped Sanji here in all of his glory and there are two paths that he can take in life. The one we're seeing now is the future of Sanji as we know him, where he grows this long Fabio style hair at age 40 and then at age 60, he just kind of looks exactly like Zeph, a mature seasoned head chef. Meanwhile, in some kind of dystopian parallel dimension where something goes very, very wrong, Sanji becomes what can only be described as a fat slob at age 40 and then by age 60, he pretty much does a full transition into a direct replica of his biological father, Judge, which is so cool. I like that no matter what future we're talking about, Sanji ends up replicating one of his father figures and he either becomes the terrible father figure or the good one. And so this is probably one of my favorite of these time skips that Oda has done so far. Speaking of Sanji though, we have a super minor, but very cool detail here with the next question. Odachi, in chapter 977, in the scene after Nami hugs Jinbei, I spotted Sanji biting on a handkerchief while going going like out of jealousy, which is another example of Oda hiding these little Easter eggs in the background. And he even replies with, wow, I'm amazed. Well done on spotting that. Since it was cut off by the page format, you might have to use your imagination a little. This Sanji is very well hidden. Good job. And I'd also suggest that you check out this video focusing on small yet mind blowing details hidden in one piece. If you're interested in more of this sort of stuff, this world is so ridiculously deep. So I look forward to seeing you there.